Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. This is Michael Voss, the Dragon of the Southern Tier, here at No Sound Bites Allowed. I am happy to be here with you because today we have a very special guest on our program. We're going to be speaking with Connor Boyack, who is with us. He's on the line as we speak. Uh, hello, Connor. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on. All right. And I did pronounce your last name correctly. Am I right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, sometimes, you know, you never know until you actually say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, now, Connor, you're a very interesting man, a young man at that. Uh, may I ask, how old are you? Let's see. I uh, just over the weekend turned 39. Well, happy birthday. I'm glad Thank to you. hear about that. Uh, so you are a young man. You're quite accomplished. Uh, actually, before I even mention that, let me first start with, uh, I do know that you had contracted COVID-19. Uh, we were going to speak about two weeks ago. How are you now? Uh, oh, I felt fine. It was actually quite an interesting experience. I uh, ended up feeling uh, totally fine. I lost my taste very briefly uh, for just a couple of days, which was an interesting experience to 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 eat things that you could not taste or smell. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I was I was totally fine, as you know, ninety nine percent of people turn out to be. Yeah. So I am one of the ninety nine percent. Well, I would have expected that, but you know, it's always good to ask it. And the family's all well, especially your children. Oh yeah, yeah. They didn't even get it at all, which was weird. You know, this highly contagious, you know, disease, and here I was kissing and hugging my family for days, and. They didn't uh, catch it at all, so pretty interesting. Well, it tends to seem that uh, children burn through it faster than everyone else. Uh, yeah. So that's always a positive, and I am glad to hear about that, and we do uh, send our best to your entire extended family. Thank you. So uh, you're 39. You are you went from California to Brigham Young University, where you studied and you graduated. Y you know, the thing is, I didn't notice in my research on you, what did you graduate with? What was your degree? My degree was in information technology, which basically just means I was a computer nerd. Uh, specifically, <laughs> I built websites and did online marketing uh, for companies. And so my background is kind of in tech. Okay. Uh, which is very interesting because what you do now isn't really anything about that. Uh, for people who are not familiar and for all of our listeners, uh, you are the creator of the Libertas Institute. You are the creator of 22 books, including the Tuttle Twins, uh, which are more targeted for children, but you also do a great deal of work about uh, uh, adult books as well. Uh, you are also a founder of a nonprofit, if I remember correctly. Is that correct? Yeah, so it, the nonprofit actually is uh, Libertas Institute. It's what's called a think tank. Uh, so we basically work on uh, changing laws and changing public opinion uh, from our perspective, more of a free market libertarian type perspective. And so our full time business is basically fighting for freedom at a state and local level and then working with groups and people like us in other states to influence places across the country. Um, and so that's kind of the full time gig and all the book writing is on the side. But, uh, yeah, I have no formal training in anything I'm doing, but we're very successful at it. And I think that goes to show that you don't need a fancy piece of paper to tell you what you can and can't do. Uh, you know, I, I totally changed my career about uh, 10 years ago and haven't looked back and we've we've thrived. So it's been a lot of fun. Well, thrive is to say the least. Uh, you have a huge and noteworthy collection of individuals that you've worked with and have spoken well of you, talking about uh, former Congressman Ron Paul, uh, Larry Reed, president of FEE, Ben Swan, uh, many people people have heard about uh, on a national level. And it, it's rather impressive to see that you've done all of these things without the training. Let me ask, what motivated you for writing books and moving out of IT? You know, like all big things, they started as small things. Uh, it, it's funny, some younger professionals and people will kind of look at what I've done and feel very intimidated or that it's daunting and they could never do that. But 
like anyone, I started very small and simple. For me, it was about 15 years ago when blogging became popular. Mm -hmm. uh, I set up a blog and I was sharing what I was learning. And I was starting to learn you know, about American history and political science and economics. And I would share my thoughts. And a lot of people started reading it. And I kind of grew a little bit of an audience. And so that then turned into my first book and then the next book and you know, the organization I was working with and different campaigns and projects. And so one thing just literally led to another um, until the point we're at today. To me, that's actually kind of a very affirming message that even, you know, people who have done a lot, it's not like I woke up one day and did all this stuff. It's been extremely incremental and anyone in any station in life, even people who have no formal training in it, as I don't, um, can still figure it out, can still adapt, can still chip away at things and build things and grow. Um, and so that's just something that I've kind of been working steadily towards uh, for many years is just uh, trying to, to grow my influence and, and my audience size and the number of people I can help and support and influence. Well, that you've done very well with. Uh, I believe you've sold about 1.2 million of the Tuttle Twins books series. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, according to Josh M. Shepard on Twitter, uh, they announced that you just hit $1 million in crowdfunding for the Tuttle Twins TV.com animated show, which puts you ahead of uh, programs like Bee and Puppycat, Dragon's Lair, um, and quite a few others. It, it's quite an accomplishment. Yeah, we're, we're very excited. In fact, now we've sold over more than 1.5 million books, a million and a half. The animated series cartoon is kind of a, a project that has grown out of that, that if there's enough demand for the books, then, hey, let's do a cartoon. So we teamed up with a production company, and uh, we did a crowd investment uh, so people could actually invest, not just donate like with a Kickstarter and hope that they get right. you know a T-shirt or something. This was actually a for-profit investment, um, and so yeah, very very strong demand. A lot of people invested money. That was a very uh, you know important thing for us because when you look at the world and things are kind of crazy right now, and, and a lot of people are shouting for you know, socialism and, and oh, yeah. bigger government and more taxes. There's a lot of families out there who want their kids to basically understand the way the world works and what some of these problems and challenges are, uh, what they can do to, you know, avoid, um, you know, having any type of uh, influence that way on their kids. And so they ultimately will find the Tuttle Twins and kind of consider it, if you will, a shield to kind of protect their kids from all these different things being thrown at us in the media, schools, and from their friends. So we see ourselves kind of in that role as helping parents you know, providing them with information and activities and resources where they can help their kids learn these ideas and, uh, you know, be more successful as they mature. Okay. Which is laudable to say the least that you've done this. A lot of people don't look at kids books as, or writing kids books as something that could be so advantageous for the future. But I see in the writing that you've done and in some of the things you've spoken about, you believe kids are very much like uh, uh, oh, uh, Dr. Seuss, that children are as capable as anyone else if you just present the information uh, in a manner that they can get. And uh, is that right? Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, as, as we put out these books, it's actually been a little surprising to me that kids love them as much as they do and uh and as i talked to their parents over the years that that is the leading theory that you know our books the tuttle twins they do present uh complex ideas and new terminology and and uh, big stories and and things and uh and they're not just random stories about nothing you know these are like actual ideas about the way the world works and so these parents will be like, yeah, no, my, my kids really love the challenge, right? They love reading material above their level. They love that these are ideas that when they're at the grocery store, they can be like, oh, now I get what was in that book. You know, there's 18 kinds of potato chips. Now I understand <laughs> specialization and spontaneous order and these concepts that were in one of the books. So, so parents really value it for that reason. The kids, you know, really come alive because this is stuff that uh, they're not getting from any of their existing books. And so it seems to have had a little bit of a sweet spot 
and uh, filling a void that has existed for some time. Well, I can see that. I mean, you have stories like the Tuttle Twins learn about the law, uh, the Tuttle Twins and the creature from Jekyll Island, which is dealing with money. Uh, you have one on socialism where the Tuttle Twins and the search for Atlas, which are interesting subjects. It's very surprising. And something that I saw on one of your sites, which really caught my attention about this, is it correct? You've mentioned that you have over 200, a quarter of a million families have bought the books for their children, and you offer a 100% guarantee satisfaction, and only nine families, uh, nine families have ever, at least uh, at the last notice that I see here, have asked for a refund. It, it, that's an incredible return. Yeah, you know, like we'll have some mistake. Uh, that, that that doesn't include like the mistaken orders, right? Oh, of we're course. accidentally of ordered course. two instead of one. But but yeah, like you know, part of it is we're very clear up front with our when you go to our website, it's very clear what's in these books, right? Like right. if you're a liberal progressive family and you love big government, it's very clear from this website that these books are not for you. So we <laughs> want to be extremely transparent. Um, and so the, the, you know, we're, we're, you, there's samples of the books you can look at and, and just from the overall, you know, description, it, it's very clear who these books are targeted towards. And that, that allows us to ensure, you know, that we're not providing these books to the wrong, uh, homes where they would get in and be like, Oh, I don't agree with this. I want to you know send them back. Uh, it's, it's actually quite the opposite. We get so much praise on social media and to our customer support team of parents largely saying, where was this when I was growing up? <laughs> and yeah. so that's a, a very good thing for us that that demand is certainly there. Well, I know you've been very popular. I mean, you have over 6,000 people on your Facebook alone um, and even more on your Twitter account. Uh, I, I just want to ask one other question about the Tuttle Twins and then I want to go into a slightly different subject because I know we have limited time. Where did you get the name, the Tuttle Twins? Why, why that name? <laughs> uh, I, I did an er interview earlier today. They asked the same question. Oh wow! Okay. It's it's not a not a very interesting answer, other than I chose it for marketing reasons. I wanted alliteration. In other words, I wanted mm -hmm. because twins starts with a T. I wanted a, a name that started with a T. I also wanted it to be simple so that kids could, you know, read it and pronounce it. And so I went on websites that have, you know, common last names, uh, find the ones that start with a T. And I started narrowing down what was available. The other criteria was I wanted to make sure that uh, there wasn't anyone famous by that name. So that, yeah. you know, the Google traffic would be full of references to those people rather than my books. I mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that the website, like the, the dot com website was available, and so uh, the the funny quick story. I don't even remember what the name was, but I had narrowed it down to five or six families, and one of the names uh, there was a, a a couple of apparently popular female twins, adults uh, with that name, who were like bikini models or something like that. Oh or, wow. Or or adult something, you know. So when I googled that name, all these pictures came up. Of these <laughs> we're like, okay, that that's not a name we're going to use. And so it was kind of a process of elimination. But uh, once we got down to the the last few, we really liked Tuttle just because it kind of rolls off the tongue. It's easy for kids, and and it checked all the boxes. The website was available. There wasn't anyone really popular by that name, and so we stuck with it. Okay. I was wondering about that because it's a, it's a little uncommon, but it makes a lot of sense. And for those who may want to go venturing into being authors on their own, some insight for them to see how yeah. they can go forward. Uh, the little things sometimes make the biggest impact. For sure. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about Libertas, your politics. A lot of people may not be aware. You've not only just been a writer of both adult books and also the very successful Tuttle Twin series, but you were in the Salt Lake Tribune, ranked you in 2019 as the 21st most influential individual in the state. Uh, you have been very active in politics, obviously, again, your Libertas Institute. I have to ask you, unless I'm misunderstanding, you are a libertarian overall in terms of your politics. Uh, but most people tend to look at Utah and consider it a more conservative, more Republican state. Has that been difficult for you? Am I understanding it correctly? 
Yeah, no, you've pegged it pretty well. I am quite libertarian uh, in my personal uh, politics and philosophy. Anyone who reads the Tuttle Twins books, I think, will uh, see that that's apparent. That is definitely the type of perspective that we discuss the world through. Um, and so, you know, in a conservative state, that's going to produce some differences. Now, the benefit is if you were to draw a Venn diagram and overlap conservatism and libertarianism, there's actually a very strong overlap. I would Absolutely. venture to guess, you know, 80%. Yeah. Um, and, and there are certainly some differences about, you know, bodily autonomy and, you know, drugs and things like that. Um, but when it comes to especially, you know, fiscal issues and property rights and taxes and all these kinds of things, there's a lot of agreement. And uh, so for our organization, we tend to primarily work within that area of overlap where we can have the greatest commonality, I'll call it, uh, with uh, elected officials who don't necessarily see themselves as libertarian, but who do see that this particular project we're working on very uh, squits, excuse me, squares uh, or fits very well with their own belief system. And for them, that's a conservative issue. For us, it's a libertarian issue, but it's just the overlap is so strong. So strategically, we try and focus and you know build common ground where there uh, are areas in common where we can work with people who you know aligns with their own values and perspective. Well, you've done a lot with that because one of the things you're very well noted for is the fact that you got to broker a deal about medical marijuana uh, with House Speaker Greg Hughes uh, and the local community, it's one which is something that many would think would not happen in Utah. Uh, so that was interesting. But the, one of the things that caught my attention is uh, you recently have been talking about privacy reform, in particular dealing with online privacy, going back to your IT roots, uh, and a concern about the Fourth Amendment and the invasion of government through IT, various you know, social media and such, going into our private lives. Uh, how has that proposal, I know you made one in back in May, it's something that you've been moving forward with and trying to get local legislation or state legislation on. How has that been moving forward? Uh, it's been moving well. This is a topic, again, where I think people of diverse political backgrounds all find interest in it. For conservatives, they want you know limited government. Uh, for uh, the left, uh, they might approach it under the banner of civil liberties, um, you know, and, and not having the gov government uh, target, you know, racial minorities using these uh, tools and so forth. So people have approached the issue of privacy from uh, different ways, but there's a lot of broad agreement um, on the issue. And so uh, in past years, especially, we've been able to enact a number of laws dealing with personal privacy. And so while we are in our state continuing to drive the issue forward with additional legislation that's kind of proactive in nature and really trying to restrict the government, we're also working with groups um, in other states to pass some of the laws that we've already got on the books. So I'll mention for your listeners, mm -hmm. uh, since we are primarily focused in Utah, what you can do is actually go to spn.org and this stands for State Policy Network. And this is kind of an association of groups like ours that work at the state or local level. We're all part of this, uh, you know, right of center groups, right? Conservative, libertarian, free market. Mm -hmm. uh, these groups are all part of the State Policy Network. And uh, each is working in their own state. Now, some are more effective than others. Some are broadly focused on many issues. Some are narrowly focused on two or three. But uh, all of these groups are trying to increase freedom and shrink the size and scope of government in their state and sometimes at a local level. And so those are groups that we will then kind of collaborate with and say, hey, on something like privacy, right, if mm -hmm. you're interested in working on it, we can help you. And we've got model language and we've got, you know, talking points and, and content and videos and so forth. And so we tend to try and work through that network to have a broader influence beyond just our state's borders. Okay. Oh, well, I do see that. And I think that's an interesting, uh, I have to look at that site a little more in detail. One thing I wanted to ask about the proposal, which is your, the Privacy Protection Act, which is uh, strongly centered on a state level at Utah, um, but tries to again address that privacy concern with the government, especially as technology is moving so much faster 
than probably most people are able to keep up with, let alone the government and all its different agencies. Uh, one question I had about that, in reading it through, uh, has anyone considered how do you address that privacy concern, uh, or has someone brought this up, dealing with the limitations on the government in uh, trying to uh, uh, use social media as an example, or maybe people's phones, biometrics, for businesses that may work in multiple states or for individuals that are uh, maybe having an offense through the state. So the law doesn't necessarily apply to them as a different state, but yet they're still dealing with Utah. Has anyone ever asked about that? Yeah, that is a, a very good question. You know, the, the nature of digital information is such that uh, <laughs> it, it, it easily crosses borders um, and it, definitely is not limited to one state. What we are focused on with our Privacy Protection Act is mm -hmm. not so much the, the data itself and where it's stored and what it is, so much as the, the government and what it can and cannot do. And so the aim is to say, hey, in, in our case, Utah, Utah, you know, police officers and sheriffs and, and law enforcement officials, if you want to use any surveillance technologies or if you want to, you know, use these tools that undermine people's privacy, whether it's the person in Utah or the person in Texas doing business in Utah or corresponding with someone in Texas, we, the state legislature in Utah, can control you, the government officials, and if you want to use these tools, here are the rules, right, or here uh, is what you need to do. Here's this process. You need to come and be transparent about it. You need to say, these are you know the tools we want to do, and here's how it implicates privacy. And you know, tell us if you have any concerns, and approve our use to go to go do it. So we are focused more on the individuals in Utah government, state and local, who are using these technologies, and less on the data or whether its owner lives in one state or not. We're saying if you are empowered by the state of Utah to, you know, enforce laws mm -hmm. and you want to use some of these tools and technologies, then you're going to have to abide by these restrictions as you're working on your cases, wherever the data takes you or wherever the person might live. Okay. I found that interesting uh, because I do, I like the proposal, especially the personal privacy oversight committee. It's, it's very unique, but that was just one of the concerns and something that I think New York state could do a good job of uh, looking over as well as many parts of this country. Uh, I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to try and jump. Uh, I wanted to ask more about that, but let me jump ahead a little bit. One, of the, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the big things that I know that you've written about personally is about home invasions, uh, no knock warrants, the Brianna Taylor case, uh, things of that nature where we see the potential for government to intrude on someone, again, Fourth Amendment, right? Their privacy, uh, but more of a physical sense of that. And I know that's something that's a big concern for you. Uh, let me ask you, and you're also an advocate of criminal justice reform, if I, my research is correct. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me ask you, in the last couple of years, it's this is a very big issue that I follow a lot, Second Amendment on red flag laws. Uh, are you familiar with the red flag laws? I am, yes. We've uh, combated them in our own state. Yes, I know. Um, most recently, back in February. And yep. I don't know what the status of that is now, but I know that they were trying to, uh, it failed in 2019 uh, to get a red flag law passed in Utah, and then they reinitialized that effort as of, uh, I think it was February. Is that, is yep. that correct? Okay. Yep, that's right. Um, I do a lot of homework. <laughs> <laughs> I pay attention to details. Uh, and this is a big subject for me. I'm very much against red flag laws, but a lot of people don't know about a lot of the consequences of those laws. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with it. Uh, but also when we take into effect, uh, into account what we see now with the movement towards social justice uh, movement, uh, the criminal justice reforms, which may be very different than in New York state versus the rest of the country, but has some similarities. I have to ask, where do you see that going in Utah? Do you see them having success with the red flag laws? 
So I don't think uh, that they'll be successful in Utah. We have a pretty solid coalition of pro Second Amendment uh, legislators. We uh, worked with a few to create a resolution uh, that this isn't binding law, but it was a resolution that whereby they kind of stated their collective opinion that, uh, you know, our existing uh, firearm laws in Utah were adequate and proper. And uh, that was kind of a way to hedge against any other amendments to the law that would undermine the existing protections in law. And the legislature resoundly, uh, I think with the exception of the Democrats and the, the single Republican sponsor of the red flag law, uh, everyone else voted in favor of the resolution. It was a great way to kind of put everyone on record to say, nah, we don't think anything needs to change. We're fine with our laws as they are. So given that kind of official opinion, uh, we don't anticipate that there's going to be any appetite to uh, make any uh, any further changes. I, I anticipate that some will still try, but uh, I think they're going to have a big uphill battle. You know, and and in the recent elections, like many uh, many legislative seats across the country have flipped Republican, yeah. and uh, there's actually you know some cause for hope there. I think that even though there's uh, apparently going to be a President uh, Biden. There's still uh, a lot of people in, um, you know, the Senate, U.S. Senate and then state legislatures that are willing to kind of stand up for things like the Second Amendment. Okay. Uh, one of, something I always ask when I know that states are looking at the red flag laws and doing my research on this of all 17 states that have enacted it so far. Are, has anyone noticed or has anyone become aware that red flag laws require the state to take children? Uh, I, I think the call dropped out. Did you say that the red flag laws require the state to take children? Yes. Um, so, I, you know, red flag laws differ, obviously. The, the devil's in the details of any specific state proposal. Uh, any bill can call itself a red flag law and then also throw in some language about taking children um, and others can omit that. I do know, though, that the child welfare laws broadly construed Mm -hmm. are are quite permissive. In other words, the uh, child welfare agencies have broad authority that if they believe that there's any abuse or neglect, that they can remove children. And if a judge has signed a, a red flag order to remove firearms from the home because someone is a danger to themselves or others, it therefore follows that they may be, you know, if you're too dangerous to have a gun because you may harm someone, then probably we ought to get the kids out of there too. And so I think even though the red flag proposals themselves may or may not have that in the legislative proposals, broadly speaking, the child welfare laws, if, if the child welfare agencies were alerted to that fact that someone had a red flag order and their guns were taken, I can very easily see the child welfare agencies stepping in and doing their own independent investigation and likely then concluding, well, if you're unsafe for that, then you're unsafe to be around kids, so we need to find them another home. Well, it's something that in my research of all 17 states, it is, in fact, uh, it's de facto law that because of the CPS in each state and their requirements, the fact that it's denying someone uh, unduly their Second Amendment rights without any crime, that it always has worked out in every one of the 17 states that that has happened. So it's something that a lot of people are not familiar with. When I spoke with Larry Sharp, Many times we've spoken, um, he was unaware of it. Most people are unaware of it unless it's been di directly brought up. Knowing that you're involved in it, I wanted to just bring it up to you. Yeah. It's a it's a big issue for me. I've been following it a lot for uh, many years now, and so uh, it's something I always like to bring up for people. Well, it should be a, it should be a big issue for all of us, frankly, right? Like, I think so. We, we need to be paying attention to this kind of stuff. A lot of it happens under the radar I think it's also a challenge with how much is happening, right? It's just hard to keep up with everything that's happening and everyone's got, you know, they're splitting, uh, spinning 20 plates at a time, focused on everything that's going on in the world. So admittedly, it's it's hard to kind of pay attention with how much information is out there. But with folks like you and others doing that homework, doing that due diligence, raising the warning voice, I do think we need to be paying attention to this stuff closely because some of it can happen sneakily and suddenly. And we need to be ready to kind of counteract any of those efforts. And so I applaud people like you who are willing to kind of educate others and do that homework because I think we need more of it. 
I, I agree. And I think you're doing a wonderful job as well, educating people with your influence. I know we have maybe two, not even, I've got 30 seconds left. Wow, it goes so fast. I'm, I'm trying to jump through so many different things. Um, with 30 seconds left, let me ask you, is there anything um, that you would want to say to my audience, to anyone who may be hearing this? Um, and I know you're going on to, because I wanted to get into it. Uh, I know you were talking today about the new mask mandate. You're going to be speaking about that in an hour or two uh, in Utah and how it's broken the law. But anything else that you'd want to speak to the public about? Um, you know, one, one of the books I wrote for adults years ago uh, is called Feardom, How Politicians Exploit Your Emotions and What You Can Do to Stop Them. And uh, of all the books I've written in the past for kind of a general audience, I'd, I'd recommend that one uh, to your listeners. It is it was difficult for me when writing that book because I was documenting all these past examples of how the government had accumulated power during uh, times when people were scared and wanted to be saved and kept safe. And uh, I felt at the time when writing that book, you know, this book is always going to be relevant uh, because it's a pattern. The government does this often. And here we are, you know, yes, uh, COVID is a health issue for many people. Yes, it is a cause con uh, for concern for many, just like many other things in the world. But it has been blown, in my opinion, so far out of proportion where the government is trying to keep everyone safe. And we are seeing a lot of precedent put in place that I think mm -hmm. is going to have future implications um, that I consider pretty worrisome. And so I agree. that book, Feardom, uh, I think is kind of a, a good uh, primer of sorts, a wake up uh, to the types of things that are happening. I, I think much like uh, Morpheus waking up Neo from the <laughs> Matrix from his slumber, you know, there are those of us out there trying to wake more people up and unplug them so that they see what's happening. And uh, I would just encourage any, everyone to, I guess, choose the red pill and uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. and, and, and wake up and, and find those trusted sources of information because there's a lot happening and we need a lot of people willing to kind of stand up and fight for what's right. I think you're doing it and you're a great example young for those young and old watching this. I wish we had more time. I, there's so much more. I, I do see why Ben Swan said you're one of the most intelligent people he's spoken with. You, you have a wealth of information and I'd love to tap into it again sometime in the future. I will check out that book. I wish you the best of luck in fighting this new mask mandate by your governor uh, because I agree with you. It does violate the understanding of the Emergency Management Act. I, I, I wish you a lot of luck in fighting that. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate you giving me the platform and uh, thanks again. You're very welcome. All right, everyone. All right. That was Connor. Thank you. And for those who are wondering, uh, we are No Sound Bites Allowed. This has been Connor Boyack that we were just speaking with. Again, a lawyer, uh, excuse me, a uh, author out in Utah, the founder of the Libertas Institute, a libertarian. Very many interesting issues that he addresses, uh, many interesting books that he has written. And I do invite you to check it out. And we'll soon be back uh, with another one of our programs here at No Sound Bites Allowed. Remember, every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we always do a live stream with you to answer your questions on everything that's going on. We again thank our guest, Connor Boyack, for having joined us today, and we hope that you have a great day as well.